Cindy, first of all, shame on them. Second of all, how can you be mean to Sister Cindy? I mean, she's just innocent, and and uh, you know what I mean? I just, how in the world? But I told her, I said, look, here. I said, Sister Cindy, I said, your pastor talking. I said, we're going to pray for you. I said, but I want you, uh, when we're done praying, I said, I want you to talk. I'm going to talk to Nathan as well, her son. I said, I want you to tell him that Pastor Meyer said, take you back up to the hospital, take you over there to Florida Hospital South or Altamont and have them hook up an IV. I said, you need some IV fluids in you. I said, because you ain't getting no better. And uh, she had said it had been a couple days since she had had even been able to urinate. I said, well, that's a sign of a problem right there. I said, you need to get some fluids right away. And uh, so she said, okay. So, you know, all I can say at the end of the day, I'm a nobody, but I am so thankful whenever you have people that will actually listen and take it, take advice when it's needed. And uh, she, she said she was going to talk to them. Well, I talked to Nathan the very next day, I believe it was, and he said we went and took her over there, and uh, they gave her the IV fluids, and good thing they, they did. It looks like that uh, in another day or whatever she should be coming home. And so our heart and prayers go out to Sister Cindy. Many different people tonight uh, that couldn't be here, some that might have liked to have been here. I talked to Sister Linda this afternoon, and uh, she's had some different things going on with her animals. She had to take them in and have surgery and different things going on. So I never know exactly what everybody's going through. I can tell you I've been through plenty of stuff myself. Uh, I had to work today, and, and, it, and uh, just about the time we were ready to, to go ahead and knock off, I'd have liked to work later but uh, I call them episodes. It's just these times where that I don't feel very good. I get feeling real loopy. Like if somebody's asking me questions, I feel almost like I'm drugged up or something. It's a weird feeling. Uh, but I just put it in the Lord's hands, and I'm having to push through it. I got to work, uh, keep food on the table. If it was up to me, I would just do pastoring, and, uh, and that'd be it. And I believe that God could use that. But until we get to that place, you know, I got to do what I got to do. A man's got to take care of his family. So you pray for us. My wife's been going through a lot as well. It's even difficult for her being up all these hours, working during the day, coming home, doing stuff, and then coming to church like this and then trying to get home in enough time to get to sleep. It's difficult. Uh, I'm trying to get so you pray for our family as a whole. I believe it's your prayers for your pastor and leadership that keep you afloat. Um, I was just discussing this recently. And uh, this is important to us as a body, and I encourage the church, stand behind people that are in leadership, no matter what it is. If it's somebody leading a choir, somebody teaching a class, or whatever it may be, or somebody on a mission field, whatever degree, if somebody's in ministry, uphold them in prayer. Because what I've noticed is there's a lot of people that are going through this compassion fatigue and empathy fatigue that I've talked about, and people get burnt out carrying the load of so many things. Uh, myself, I can see how people can get there when you're trying to carry your everyday load of work and everything else and trying to prepare for sermons and trying to carry the load of the finances of the church. And we get many different people that contact us through the Internet that watch our services uh, for encouragement and different things. It's a lot for one person to bear. So I'm telling you, always uphold us in prayer. And I will go as far as to tell you tonight that also, not just that, there are people that contact us letting us know they're praying for us. I have sometimes people I don't even know, I know. I've never met them before, just say, just wanted you to know the Lord put you on our heart today. And I believe it's because of those prayers that we're here today. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you're watching the ministry, we have some people that watch faithfully. And uh, we have more than what Brother Eric said tonight. But I will tell you this. There are also more than what's, what you see in this house. There are people that are watching online, people that are blessed by the ministry. And I've just got my eyes off the crowd and got them on the cloud. And I believe that's what God's going to do. That's how God's going to help us. We've got to put our attention where it really matters tonight. God didn't call me as a pastor to worry about all that other folk are doing. Now, not to be a lack of concern for the church, but i tell you this. I'm going to do what God called me to do, and if other people don't do, they're going to give an account for that in the day of judgment. How many of you tonight says, I want the Word of God? I want it to get down in my heart. Amen. So we're going to give you the word with God's will and help tonight. Sorry for the long delay of talking, much speaking tonight. I also want to apologize. I'm running late without a long, drawn-out excuse. I got locked out of the house, and it was a rigmarole to get. Uh, rigmarole is the words we use in the South. 
So to those of you in the north watching and you're up in Michigan somewhere, up in what we call the Yankee States up there somewhere, God bless you folks. That just means it was a mess. It was a whole mess, a rigmarole. But we had a rigmarole tonight, and uh, I finally got to the house of the Lord. I, I was probably running about 18 minutes late or something, and I don't like that. So my apologies. I like to be punctual, so God bless all of you for putting up with me and just jumping in. Thank you for just jumping in and worshiping the Lord while I was on my way here. Luke chapter number 24 and verse 49. We're going to jump around to a couple different places. Now, if you know me, you know I don't typically do this. I don't like to do this. I don't like to do anything that may create a little bit of a confusion on what we're doing, but there's a reason, and I feel like God's going to use this tonight, just as a more of a, a, a teaching thing tonight, a preaching teaching, if you will, uh, dealing with a subject I feel like is important for the church to consider. Luke 24 and 49, then we're going to turn over to Acts 1 and 8, which m- what most of you know, and then Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. And if you have Luke 24 and 49, say amen. I believe Justin may have it up on the board. And he said, Behold, I and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry it in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Verse 52, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. We got it right, brother? Luke 24, verse 49, 50, 51, and 52. We may have it mixed up. If we do, it's, is it up there? All right, praise the Lord. Amen. We'll get it after a while. Praise the Lord. We'll get it right. You're all right. That's all right. Amen. If you're watching online, it's Brother Eric's fault. Praise God. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8. If you got that or if you want to hang in here with me. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says there, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now we're going to skip to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and verse number 20. All of this with the Lord's help we're going to tie in together. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore... Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, this might catch you a little off guard, but this is what Pastor Myers is going to be talking about tonight. You ready? Are we really Pentecostal? Are we really Pentecostal? That's the question of the hour tonight. Will you stretch your hand of the Lord and ask God to have his will and way over this service? Father, tonight as we come before the throne humbly, we know without you, God, we're not much. But with with you tonight, we're everything. We're a mighty army in God with a captain and a general who knows how to direct us, lead us, guide us, and help us to win the battles that are before us. I pray tonight, God, that you will speak to every one of us through the word of God. And I pray that you will help me to use wisdom as a man of God, as a preacher of the gospel, to share exactly what you would have me to say. We'll give you praise for what you do in this service tonight. In Jesus' name, everyone can say amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you love him. Is it all right if I take, who will let me take my time tonight? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, at least that's two-thirds of the congregation. Amen. 
Are we really Pentecostal? Now, here's the deal. If you've got to leave at any given time, I tell my wife the same thing. If I get long-winded and I preach a little too long and you've got to get up and skedaddle or whatever, you do whatever you've got to do and let me do what i got to do. How about that? We'll make a deal. You do what you've got to do and I'm going to do what i got to do. I gotta, I gotta obey the Lord here, and we're gonna try to be as timely as, as possible. But you gotta remember, sometimes it's hard to put 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. You understand what I mean? Anyway, but, uh, how many of us here today, I wanna start off with a little question, just get our mind kind of engaged here. But how many of us here today feel like that we associate personally on a personal level or identify as Pentecostal? Raise your hand. Brother Ralph, you Pentecostal back there? Praise the Lord. How many of you say, I feel like I'm Pentecostal? Amen. You see, the truth is, is that if I were to individually pull you off to the side, everybody, those even watching, I was to pull us all to the side, take our Sunday morning crowd, pull everybody into one of the side rooms and individually interview each and every person and ask them what exactly Pentecost was to them and why that they identify as Pentecostal. I would no doubt get a host of different answers from different people because I believe that we may have our own unique idea or view of what Pentecost is or what Pentecostal has to do with. You see, the more common answers that we may get when it comes to those questions, and I was to say, Brother Ralph, what do you, what do you say? What do you think Pentecost means? Or why do you call yourself Pentecostal? Or why is it that if somebody asks you what denomination or what church or what group or what are you affiliated with, why would you say Pentecostal? If I was to ask you that question, amen, some of the more common answers that we may get may be something like this the fact that the disciples prayed in the upper room and you know we're supposed to be a praying church and so because the disciples prayed uh, during the days of Pentecost well I'm also Pentecostal or somebody might say the fact that the disciples believed for the promise of the Father by faith uh, and we're to be a people of faith and so I am Pentecostal because of that or somebody might even say the fact that there were 120 that were baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues and, and that means we're Pentecostal. Hey Amen. There might be a lot of things that people say if I was to ask them why that they feel like that they are Pentecostal or why they associate themselves with what some have called the Pentecostal experience. But you see, when I look at this, the many answers that I believe uh, that could be given. Some of them are general and good answers uh, to a degree. But it is the, in, the the smaller, more detailed and some of the other answers that people may give uh, and their ideology about Pentecost and Pentecostalism that may concern me because as the church has began to evolve over the years and the Pentecostal movement, most all of us already know, there are different splinter groups uh, that have associated themselves with the terminology Pentecost or Pentecostalism or Pentecostals. Uh, there are some tonight, hey amen, that one time I re even remember doing a research uh, and I started looking at the different factions and splinter groups of Pentecostalism uh, and I even found a group that was called the Mormon Pentecostals. Uh, hey amen, I came across another group called the Free Love Pentecostals and dear God, what a mess that was. Uh, hey amen, some of you at home don't Google it, praise God. It just save you, just save you time. Free love Pentecostals. Uh, and what I found out, uh, they believed that, hey amen, once you got saved and you're a part of the church, uh, they believed in the whole Pentecostal experience as most of us understand it. But they had a twist to it uh, and they believed once you came into the church uh, that his wife was also your wife uh, and, and uh, her husband was also your husband. Uh, it's a flat out mess. Uh, but how many knows uh, if we're going to be the real thing, we got to go back to the word of God uh, and see what the Bible had to say about it. Can you say amen? You see, some would, uh, you know, if I was to interview us individually and I was getting right down to it, 
Some of you may not say it with your mouth, uh, but your interpretation mentally of what Pentecost is. Uh, amen. Maybe a lot of other things. Uh, you may walk into a church uh, and you don't know what name is on the door and you walked into any given church and sit through the service. You might think, well, they're Pentecostal because they shout or they speak in tongues. Uh, or you may walk into any given church uh, or you think Pentecost is because uh, we're the loudest church in town. How many knows us Pentecostals? Uh, we can get kind of loud. Uh, amen. Well, it's the loudest church in town. He's the biggest mouth preacher. He's got to be the kingpin of Pentecost because he's the loudest big mouth that I ever did hear. Amen. That's what some people associate Pentecost with. Uh, or it's because our preacher's on fire. Well, I hate to tell you, break it to you. I've been to some Baptist churches uh, and I've even been to some Methodist churches uh, that got loud uh, and some of them uh, that even speak in tongues. Uh, he's saying the Baptist, yeah, there's some wholeness Baptists uh, and there's some other that believe like that uh, and there are also some that get kind of loud. Uh, and I tell you, it ain't all about and just in that can you say amen. Well, pastor, it's because we got services where the preacher didn't get to preach. Uh, have you ever heard anybody say, well, we had a good service. The preacher didn't even preach. Uh, my Lord, uh, when you're the preacher and they say we had a good church service, the preacher didn't even get to preach. Uh, and on the surface, that sounds a little hilarious. Uh, well, thank God, old oh, sorry preacher, we didn't have to hear him this morning. Uh, that ain't what folks mean. Uh, they cannot tell you Pentecost don't mean. Uh, hey, man, because a preacher don't get to preach. Uh, hey, does or doesn't ever so often. Uh, or because we had that kind of service. Uh, it's because our worship services uh, are so powerful, preacher. Thank God for powerful worship service. Uh, and I tell you that Pentecost isn't just because uh, we have powerful worship services. Uh, and I tell you what I've noticed over the years. Amen. Back in the day, uh, there was an anointing on the Pentecostal church worship. Uh, they could get up and sing some of the old red back hymnal songs. Uh, stop in between stanzas. Uh, they didn't have smoke. They didn't have the service blacked out. Uh, and I tell you while I'm right here, hey man, I don't throw off on anything that gets a man saved uh, or gets him full of the Holy Ghost uh, or whatever the case may be. But I have the hardest time really understanding. Uh, maybe I just haven't arrived yet. Uh, I don't understand the whole philosophy of why that when it's dark outside, uh, we need to turn the lights off in here. Uh, hey man, come on now and throw some neon lights around the room. Uh, hey man, I don't know, does that make you feel like you're in the mood to have Pentecost? Uh, I feel like when you do that, uh, it makes me think I'm down at AMC Theater. I just need me a big a big popcorn uh, and a big old two liter thing of soda that I paid six dollars for this. Come on now, somebody. Everybody's got their own take. Uh, but how many of you know, uh, hey man, there are churches that ain't Pentecost uh, by name or identification uh, that have powerful worship services uh, and those that get up magnify God. Uh, but how many of you know tonight all of those things may take place? Uh, in our church, but they don't make us Pentecostal. Can you say, God help us tonight? Amen. It's because our worship service is so powerful. Well, you know, while all of these things have their place, these characteristics of themselves are not what identifies best with Pentecost or makes us Pentecost. Somehow or another, we've got the idea that if we shout, if we run, run an aisle, get excited, tap dance, run into each other. Hey, man, can I be real with you? Man, I've been in some powerful services. How about you? I've also been in services where people are running into walls and button down, knocking knots on the head and hey man, running down pews and knocking chairs over and falling down, getting up, bruised the whole side of their body. Uh, hey man, didn't accomplish a thing but make themselves look like a crazy person. Uh, I've seen a whole lot of things uh, and sometimes people are trying to mimic uh, a Pentecostal move of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and I tell you, if we'll get back to the real basics uh, of what made Pentecost took place, uh, you may shout uh, and you may run uh, and you may speak in tongues, uh, but I can tell you what I've seen in the church today has got me a little bit concerned uh, is that we're trying to mimic a move of God uh, instead of just letting a move of God come 
come because we have got down on the wings of prayer and we got anointed and the Holy Ghost came down and baptized the people in the congregation or people are going out into the highways and hedges uh, compelling people to come in they're getting saved uh, I've watched men get up uh, to open up a service uh, and they start out like I am right now in the beginning and it's all a bunch of charisma and charismatic foolishness to take up an offering praise God are you going to give tonight in the offering ain't it going to be in the house of God tonight I don't care how much you yell. I don't care how much you scream. I don't care how much you get, amen, pumped up. And you cannot mimic a real move of the Holy Ghost. You know, let me tell you, the preachers that I admire and blow my mind are people like Sister Linda Baltman that can start off like a truck in granny gear trying to pull a stump out of the ground. And before she's done preaching, she's plowing a tater row and blowing the place apart, preaching the house down. Let me tell you tonight, what we really need is people to understand what Pentecost really is. Hey Amen. Let's get away from all this sensationalism, emotionalism, and everything that we think Pentecost really is. Uh, amen. What is Pentecost tonight? And what is it not? Yeah, some of you may say, well, Pastor, are you sure about all of this? Well, I'm afraid that the understanding of what has taken place in our Pentecostal world today or in the churches is that it's all about excitement and charisma and sensational worship. And I believe all that has its place. Well, let me ask you a question. You've ever been somewhere where you could tell they were trying so hard and God wasn't in it. Huh? Folks, here's the truth. I've been around long enough to know you can try to make it like God's there. Make it like God's doing something big. But I found out that if God wants to, he'll come by in a wave of conviction and have one of them services where people ain't saying too much and they're off in the corner praying quietly because they're under such conviction they don't want anybody around them to know what in the world they're even praying about. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about because I'll tell you, it'll blow your mind the way that some people pray at home but the way they pray when they get to church. It's because we gotta put on our Pentecostal. Let me tell you, when the glory of God comes down, it might make you pray with more fervency, but just praying fervently in itself by speech and vocabulary and all of that and charisma, that does not make me a new Pentecostal. But I'll tell you what does. It's whenever you get down and you're sincere and by faith and prayer until the Holy Ghost comes down. I don't care if you start out praying like a church mouse. You're laying on the floor and you ain't even saying two or three words. There are some of you, you know what I'm saying. Uh, there are times you get down to pray and you can't even put a whole sentence together and you say things that don't even make sense. Uh, but you keep on praying and you keep on trusting God. And before you know it, uh, the Holy Ghost comes down. Can I tell you, you can try to make it for us. Uh, and I've seen a lot of preachers and a lot of churches do it. Uh, but what we really need in this hour is a demonstration of Pentecost uh, to flood the church and show us what Pentecost really is. Uh, because Pentecost, uh, I said, True Pentecost will produce fruit in the church. Say amen, somebody. You see, a lot of times I would go as far as to say it seems like today there's a lot of people that actually worship, worship. They worship preachers, worship preaching, worship certain musics and certain styles of music. But I can tell you for us to know the distinct characteristics that are directly, directly linked to Pentecost that have everything to do with Pentecost, you and I got to go all the way back to the Bible accounts. In Luke chapter number 24, I read you in our text, Sister Reba, they were told of the coming promise, the Holy Ghost. He's on the way. There's a purpose behind the Holy Ghost being sent. There's a reason why. And this has everything to do with what was going to happen on the days of Pentecost. And then in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible said they were told there, it shows what they, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, you see, they were told... Uh, 
the purpose for the promise that they had already been told about. They were told the promise is coming. Then they were told there's a purpose behind me giving you that power. I hate to say it tonight, uh, but I'm afraid that I've been around this thing long enough. There are some people that think that God gave them the Holy Ghost just to speak in tongues. Uh, that God gave them the Holy Ghost uh, to run up and down the aisles of the church. Uh, or the Holy Ghost gave them or the power of the Holy Ghost uh, to out sing or out preach somebody uh, or to be the best camp meeting speaker. Uh, and I'll tell you what he gave you power to do. Uh, it's power to live right, power to talk right, uh, power to proclaim the word of God, uh, power to spread the gospel everywhere under heavy persecution. Uh, He gave us Pentecost uh, because there was purpose and that purpose was going to give us the Holy Ghost uh, which would empower us to do a great work. Well, he gave me the power of the Holy Ghost to show up at church. That's great. Well, I paid my tithes. That's great. But I'm going to tell you, if you want to associate your name and your your identity as being Pentecost and being Pentecostal, there's a whole lot more to it than what we might see on the surface. They had they had been given a mission. Sister Kathy in chapter number 28 and verse 18 of Matthew said, Jesus came and spake unto them, say, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And he said, Lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world. Amen. Uh, You see, he had told them, I've given you a mission, but now after Pentecost, he gave them the power to carry out that mission. Do you know that when he gave you the Holy Ghost, uh, it was the kiss of God on our life uh, to baptize ties you with the fullness of the Holy Ghost to empower you to do more than just hold a pew down. Now I know this may not be popular. It may upset and stir a lot of folks up but I want to tell you something. The reason why that we're not seeing the real Pentecostal experience being manifested today and why we're seeing so many that are having to emulate, to make it sound like, to make it feel like it's Pentecost is because not enough people are truly baptized in the Holy Ghost. I hate to go here, but I've mentioned this in the past, but I remember it was many years ago. It could have been 20 years ago now. But I remember that somebody had shared with me a report that said something along the lines of in the church of God that it was right 49% or something like that of the people that are members of the church of God of Cleveland, Tennessee that claim to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Where the controversy was this, that any time that a movement falls below 50% of what they identify with as being Pentecostal, that there's a problem with that. Here's what I have a greater problem with. You and I have been around this thing long enough. You know I'm telling you the truth when I say that not everybody that says they got the Holy Ghost even got the Holy Ghost. And I got to say, Brother Farmer, when I heard that, I thought, dear God, if 49% of the church of God claimed to have the Holy Ghost, uh, I'd be surprised if 15 or 20 really got it. Uh, if you got 100% of a movement and ain't but 20, 25, 35, or even 45% of a movement got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a wonder, it's no wonder why that we may say we're Pentecostal, but we're not seeing the signs and the wonders uh, and the gifts and the manifestation uh, that God would want to uh, show us in the Word of God. Right here in our everyday life. Pentecost is much more than having an exciting service. I don't know if I can bring this out the way God gave it to me. I felt so defeated when I got home this afternoon and I didn't feel well. And I told my wife, I said, it's days like this. I'd give almost anything to be a full-fledged, full-salaried pastor where I could spend my whole day just studying what God's given me. But instead, I'm working and I got to come home. I don't feel good. I got to lay down a little while, pull this together. So you bear with me with my little bit of attempt tonight to share with you what God gave me with this. I'm going to tell you something, church that if we're going to be that Pentecostal church, we're going to have to mind the things and demonstrate and be manifested in our church if we're really going to be Pentecostal. What did that early church see that we're not seeing? Well, I can tell you that what Pentecost is not and not indirectly. Pentecost, I want you to hear me well. It's what the Holy Ghost gave to me while I was trying to lay it out and go to sleep last night. I'm trying to put it in my phone as quick as I could. Pentecost is not a denomination or a movement. 
Amen. Whenever the days of Pentecost took place, I don't believe uh, that God was purposely intended to just create a movement called Pentecost. Though I may identify with what took place on the day of Pentecost, I don't believe that it was the mind of God to create a Pentecostal movement, so to speak. I believe what God was trying to do was create a church movement, a movement of people who were really baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, there might be Pentecostal people, or they call themselves Pentecost that associate with the experience that took place on that day and that's all fine and well and I have no problem with that but Pentecost was more than just a title of a denomination it's an elevated state of emotion no it's not Pentecost or Pentecostal is an elevated state of emotion well I guess whenever them Braves fans down there in the stadium in the stands and their fella, their number one man gets up to bat and knocks a ball clean out of the park and they, their emotions are in a heightened state of emotion. I suppose they're Pentecostal too. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That ain't Pentecost. Well, I gotta, I'm not telling you that Pentecostal people ain't gonna get emotional. You're looking at somebody probably one of the most emotional people when I feel the Holy Ghost there is. But Pentecost, just because you feel a goosebump, that don't make it Pentecost. Come on, somebody. Well, it's a shouting church. Let me tell you, I thank God for shouting churches, uh, but I also thank God for word churches, uh, and I thank God for crowds that'll listen. Uh, I've been in churches before where everything was about to shout. I believe it ought to be a balance. Somebody say amen to me right here. I thank God for people that shout and get in and worship. Amen. I thank God for times of refresh. But I also thank God there's people that'll sit there and listen to the word of God, soak it in and apply it to their life. I've been in places where that I feel like that somebody got out of order and didn't go lay hand on that one, gonna do this and that and the other, and God wasn't in it. Amen. The whole service went a whole other direction while Sinners sat there in the pew and went home just as lost as they did before. I still believe preaching of the word of God is what we need. And we need to mind the Lord more than anything at all. I've seen times before where the spirit of God would move. And the preacher didn't get to preach. And had he preached, they may not have got saved. But there's got to be a balance within the church. I remember being in a revival several years ago. I hope this is all right. And I remember Brother Steve, Monday night. They shouted, they jerked, they shook, they hopped, they jumped. And I, I didn't preach. I got Tuesday night. They jumped, they jerked, they shouted, they hopped, they danced. I didn't get to preach. Wednesday night, they did the same thing. Thursday night, they did the same thing. Come Friday night. That's all right. I'm preaching tonight. Because some of these people, you may think I'm crazy, but I've been in some places where that they love to shout more than they love to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Believe it or not. So Friday night came around, same thing. They jumped, they shook, they jerked, they spit, they slung their hair, they danced, they rolled. And when they got done and they looked up and their clothes all a mess, thank God, it's all right, that's all fine with me. Take out your Bibles and turn with me to chapter so and so. And their eyes got real big. I said, it's all right, we're going to preach tonight. I didn't come here to just, amen, shout with you. Thank God for that. I said, but I still believe we need to preach the word of God. Amen. Some may fall out and say, well, preacher, no, you'd have had to been there to fully understand. Pentecost ain't just jumping and hopping and shouting and running and speaking in tongues. I've been in places where you get some ninny who don't even serve the Lord in fullness. Got sin in the closet. But every service, they're going to stop the service and go lay hands on somebody and tell them God showed them something. Well, a lot of times it ain't nothing more than you ate too many tacos last night and you had a dream and you come along with some hocus pocus. Sister Farmer had a dream. You fell off a rooftop and I don't know what that means but God showed it to me. Amen. Somebody talked talk to me about this here a while back. I said I don't mean to be a skeptic. I said but I try the spirit. Everybody that comes to me with a dream everybody that likes to lay hands on me I don't go with everything because I go with what's real with what bears witness with what is in my soul. 
come to me and tell me God's going to do a certain thing and it don't happen, you know what the Bible says? That's false prophecy. False prophecy. And I want to tell you, while I'm on the subject of this, as far as it concerns Pentecost, we have, why I'm telling you and preaching this tonight, we have gravitated and evolved far away from the biblical principle of a lot of things. Prophecy is one of them. Today, prophecy is nothing more than modern day fortune telling. You see, if you go back and study the Bible, you'll, you'll see what I'm saying. Prophecy in the Bible, most every single time was about pending judgment that God was going to bring on the people. Prophesy to the people. Tell them that I'm going to do thus and so. But today, prophecy equals having made your big mass services where you get major congregations and calling people out of the crowd. I think you got a big, I think you got a corn on the side of your toe. Oh, wait a minute, I think it's been there about two years. That ain't nothing but fortune telling. That ain't, that's not prophecy. Whenever somebody calls you out of that pew and they look at you and tell you that God has already declared a certain thing in your life, you might be going through a place of your life, you're about to get a divorce, and they call you out and God said, I just want you to know that he's going to put that marriage back together. That's prophecy. But calling out somebody and just telling your mother's and cousin's aunt's and uncle's that God's about to do a big thing. Come on, man. Hey, man, I read in the Bible. I never read nowhere in the Bible where some prophet went to somebody and said, God, about to do a big thing. You better get specific. Quit talking in generalities. Anybody can say God's about to do a big thing. Hey, man, because, you know, a lot of times people don't want to be specific because God ain't in it. Hey, man, if God told you, then tell me what it is. Well, God about to do, what is he about to do? Huh? You say, Pastor, does God always work like that? He may not tell you the details every single time, but I think a lot of folk are just a bunch of fake, phony, baloney. Come on, somebody. Hey, man, if you're gonna, I was at somebody told me here a couple of years back, they said that somebody in my church went to some healing service uh, at some big uh, blow you down place uh, in the floor, pick you back up, blow you down, and pick you back up. Uh, and they said they walked over to a man and a wife uh, that wasn't married sitting on the pew and was supposed to go tell them stuff. And the first thing they asked, y'all married? I don't know. I mean, you know so much, you tell me. You better come start prophesying to me, start telling me what God's about to do and you don't even know if we're married. Come on now. Huh? Well, Pastor, you're being a little critical. No, I'm just sick to my guts with fake stuff that flies under the radar as Pentecost. Get real, because the real thing is uh, that when a prophet calls you out, uh, you remember whenever God sent a prophet to, amen, to David, David had a man's wife, a wife's a husband killed in battle, and he got her pregnant. He committed adultery, got a woman pregnant, Bathsheba, and God sent a prophet, gave him a riddle, and looked at David when David said, oh, I think you ought to die. And the prophet looked him in the face and said, Thou art the man. Honey, that's prophecy. A lot of stuff that goes on today is a bunch of foolishness flies under the radar at Pentecost and you won't find it in the New Testament like that. How many of you hear what I'm saying? You got to get back to the Word of God. Somebody say, God, help us tonight. It's not just a worship conference because I love worship times and all of this, but I'm afraid that there has been an emphasis on worship to the point that worship supersedes who we are worshiping. They put, they put all the emphasis on the experience. Now we've got to have light shows and demonstrations and scrolling boards and neon lights. I'm not trying to keep up with, with Hollywood. I'm not trying to, amen, to try to keep up with every technology there is. Amen, just a supernatural touch of God. Honey, the truest form of worship is going to take place when you're all by yourself. He said to get in your closet a prayer. I'll tell you the greatest place you can worship God is whenever you're not going to get credit for it. When people can't look at you. Come on now. And I'll go as far tonight to say when your worship turns into sincere, pure worship. Amen. To the point that you're not worried about who sees you. Come on. That's real worship. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you worship differently when you're around people because you want to put on a show? Huh? 
Do you, when you pray, do you pray differently than you pray when you're at home, just you and the Lord? Put on a show. I mean, there's a lot to think about, folks. But there's a whole lot of flesh that has gotten involved in what we call Pentecost. I'm just saying tonight, we got to get back to the real thing. And the real thing is, is that on the days of Pentecost, the, the emphasis was not just on tongues either. Well, I'm Pentecostal. Pentecostal does not, does not just mean tongues. But I guarantee you, the average person that knows anything about religion and you tell them I'm Pentecostal, the first thing that comes to their mind, speaking in tongues. But as a genuine, true blue Pentecostal, there are nine gifts of the Spirit, not one. And I believe in every nine of those gifts tonight. It's not an emphasis just on one particular gift. But I believe tonight if we're going to call ourselves Pentecostal, we better get back to believing every single one of those gifts. Well, Pastor, I was kind of hoping I can get a position in the church. Let me ask you a question. How many folks want one of the gifts of the Spirit? He gave those nine gifts for a purpose. You see, I got a hold of this as a young Christian. I hope this is going across good tonight. I know this is Pastor Myers talking to his midweek service church crowd, and I understand this. But when I first got saved, I did get a hold of this. And this is what I started praying. Can I give you a little piece of a testimony? hope I ain't been preaching too long tonight. But the preacher started talking about the overall reality of Pentecost and all the gifts of the Spirit. And I got to read my Bible. I guarantee if you start reading your Bible, there will be a lot of things that come to you without somebody having to come to you and point it out to yourself. But I read there where it talked about all the other gifts of the Spirit. And I read where Paul was talking about prophecy. And Sister Reba, I got down and I started praying. I had already been blessed of the gift of tongues and interpretation God first started using me as a young Christian when I got filled with the Holy Ghost to give out messages in church to me as a young Christian to be a part of that it just to me it was one of the greatest and special most unique things to be used in that fashion but I got down I started praying I said God I want the gift of prophecy I want you to give me the gift of prophecy the Bible tells us to cover the best gifts to pray for these things, that God would use us in these things, these areas. And I got down and I started praying, God, give me the gift of prophecy. I'd been praying this for quite a while, and I was in a church service one night. And if you've been around the church very long, you know what I'm talking about when I say there was those times where the power of God's moving and all of a sudden things get real quiet. And God has spoken to my spirit and told me what to say. Man, I stood there, what if, what if, what if, what if it ain't God? What if it's not God? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? I'm talking, somebody needs to hear this tonight. And I'm standing there, what, what praise God. And now all, all of a sudden, it was just like, it just left. And the most amazing thing happened. All of a sudden, somebody on the other side of the church stood up and said the very same thing that God had just put in my heart to say. And God spoke to me and said, you disobeyed me. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. That right there did something in me. It, it, it was just like taking a bucket of cold ice water and pouring it on me. You told me I went home. And I laid in my bed, and I was crying. My wife came and said, what's wrong with you? I said, the Lord spoke to me and chastised me. She said, what do you mean? I told her what happened. I couldn't stop crying, Sister Kathy. I couldn't stop bawling and squalling. I was a young Christian, a new Christian, if you will. I didn't really understand that much, but I knew I wanted the, I wanted the gifts of the Spirit in my life. And I can tell you that it was a long, long, long time. It was several years later. I had prayed and I had prayed, but God never gave me that. And one night we were in a revival where the Lord was moving and I went to another church after that revival service was over. Amen. I started uh, speaking that night at another church after I'd already preached somewhere else. And all of a sudden, the power of God fell in that place. And I remember standing in the corner of a room and I was praying with somebody. And it was almost like God opened up my mouth and put the words in there. And before I even realized, I opened up my mouth and God began to use it and prophesied somebody something that came to pass and God showed it to be real. And I'm going to tell you something. If you want God to fill your mouth, he will. 
I tell you tonight, uh, if you want to be the real Pentecostal church, uh, stop worrying about when the last time you ran an aisle. Stop worrying about when the last time you shouted your hair now. Start concerning yourself with how many souls you brought into the church. Start concerning yourself with how much of the gifts of the Spirit are in operation in our church, uh, in our Sunday school department, in our little children's church. Uh, Start concerning yourself with how many times uh, that the young people come into our church and see a demonstration of the Holy Ghost. I wouldn't mind having the kind of service that the young people are just their mouths on the floor looking around at the power of God being demonstrated in their presence. I believe that we need to get back to real Pentecost. Anybody believe that? Say amen. I told you I'm sorry if I preached too long, but these are the little nuggets, the little chicken nuggets that God gave me, and I'm going to share them with you. Pentecost wasn't all of those things indirectly, but what Pentecost was, this is the meat and potatoes of it, so I hope you hung on all the way to here. It was a manifestation of power. He said, behold, he said, I will, he said, whenever you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, he said, you will be endued with Whenever you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you'll be endued with tongues. Not any what he said. Whenever you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're going to be baptized with excitement. Well, you might be excited, but that ain't what he said. Whenever you get the Holy Ghost, it's going to baptize you with goosebumps. That ain't what he said. He said, I'm going to, he said, I'm going to, you're going to be endued with power. From on high, this ain't any other kind of power. This is power from on high. What I'm telling you is, is that the reason why the church is in trouble is there ain't enough people baptized with power from on high. We still got people running around, and I am telling you, I'm careful what I say. We still got people coming, running around, amen, speaking in the same old worn out tongue for 35 years. What do you mean, preacher? Some of them, they haven't had a refreshed touch, and they're still running around, D, 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 la, 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 and there ain't no power, no Holy Ghost in it, and there ain't no speaking in tongues. It's nothing more than a repetitious motion of the tongue. Amen, let's get real here tonight. When the Holy Ghost breaks your tongue loose, and baptizes you you're going to do more than just impress the crowd because you can speak in a tongue there's going to be power in your life power is demonstrated through the life of a child of God baptized in the Holy Ghost I'd go as far as to say that the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is power first and tongues as evidence second. You can say it any way you want to, but I believe if you got a tongue and you ain't got no power, you better go back to the power plant. Boy, this may not go over well with some folk, but praise God anyway. Pentecost was a manifestation of power. Whenever you got no self-control over your flesh, you better go back to the power plant. You better go back to the source where you got plugged in the first time. You see, I know this don't get preached very much, but I still believe it like the old timers preach when I got saved. You ever heard this about being refilled with the Holy Ghost? Is that biblical? Yes, there were people in the scripture that got refilled and they were filled more than once. What I'm telling you is that I've watched a lot of people become cold and calloused and sit on a church pew. (laughs) The pastor gets up and says, Hey, how many people wants to fill the church? How many like to see God fill this church? I'm tell you, before we call ourselves Pentecostal, before we raise our hands and say we want to see this church fill, we've got to get down in an altar and really seek God for ourselves. Say, God, revisit my soul and fill it full of the greatest power on planet earth. And I tell you tonight, uh, amen, you might have had it in the past, uh, but my question is tonight, do you still got it? Uh, Amen, tonight, uh, if the Lord was to give you the opportunity, could you pray somebody through? If there was a demon-possessed person, do you got the anointing and the power of God in you to pray them through? Amen. Several years ago, I'm going to tell you a little story. Several years ago, Brother uh, Don Rich, it was, and best of my remembrance, he had told a story about a lady. He had a radio broadcast ministry. This is going way back several years ago. 
And he said, this lady had called in and she said, I need you to pray for me. He said, what's the matter with you, sis? He said, well, she said, well, I've got a son who's demon possessed and said, he'll slap me and he'll punch me and he pulls my hair. He lives with me. He's demon possessed. He needs deliverance and I need you to pray for me. He said, all right, I'll be praying. She said, no, I want you to come to my place, my house and pray. He said, at the time, he said, I was a very busy pastor running radio broadcast ministry in and out of hospitals and uh, the church and several other projects and mission work and different things going on. Hardly any time to think. And he said, the spirit checked him. And he said, sis, he said, I'll call you whenever I'm ready to come. He said, because of a busy schedule and everything else, he said, I felt ill-prepared to go to that lady's house. But he said he got praying and fasting and seek the Lord, and the Lord told him to go. And he said the day that he showed up on the, on the lady's front doorstep, said, here come that demon-possessed guy coming out there and was going to try to kill him. He said, when that guy lumbered out the door, he was a huge boy. And he said, he looked at him. Best of my remembrance serves me right. Been many years since I heard or told this story. But he looked at that young man and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he said, stop right now in the name of Jesus and come out from him. Come out of him, devil, in Jesus' name. All of a sudden, after many days of fasting and many days of praying, that power was manifested. That boy hit the concrete, kablam. He said his mama threw her hands up in the air, got to walk around and praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. He said a few minutes went by. He said, I joined in with her. He said, we were walking around that boy. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. He said, all of a sudden, I heard a third voice join in and look down, and that boy had his hands straight up in the air. Praise God. Can I tell you, the church has got to get back to having the power. Let me tell you tonight, I still believe that if we'll get back to the power to raise the dead, power to cleanse the leper, power to open up blinded eyes, power to heal the sick, that's when we can say we're really Pentecostal. It's a manifestation of power. I want to tell you it is the supernatural. Supernatural. That that cannot really clearly easily be explained. I want to tell you folks, on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, cloven tongues like as a fire was a supernatural event sat upon each of their heads. And the Bible said, research history would tell you that it was anywhere between 12 to possibly as many as 15 different languages that they began to speak simultaneously and people from all different walks of life got spoke to and preached to and gave their life. Peter stood up after he had already fell away from the Lord and denied the Lord, but Peter got full of the Holy Ghost, okay? And whenever Peter got full of the Holy Ghost, the supernatural took place with the Eric. And whenever he preached, 3,000 souls got saved. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? 3,000 souls got saved, but 12 to 15 different languages. Let me tell you, these are people that had never learned this language before. Today, even on our foreign mission fields, there are times that they may have to use an interpreter or such as that. But I say, God, manifest yourself in a supernatural Pentecostal kind of way. God, reveal yourself through that Holy Ghost power. Amen. Not long after I got saved, I had a friend of mine who went to a church service one night, Brother Farmer, and he said there was a Japanese lady that came in there, invited by a co-worker, and when the altar call was given, a message was given out in tongues. Uh, Amen. All of a sudden, uh, here come this lady, a Japanese lady that was invited. uh, She wallowed down to the front, got down there, and squalled and cried like a baby, and gave her life to God. Uh, After the service was over, somebody asked her, said, what was it uh, that caused you to come down to the front of the church? Uh, She said, I didn't know you had somebody in your church that spoke Japanese. Uh, And they said, no, we don't. Uh, Said, well, tonight, uh, whenever that service got over, and the preacher quit preaching, somebody spoke in Japanese 
tonight because the Lord spoke directly to me and said, you've been running from me. You need to come to this altar and give your life to Christ. As she bawled and squalled and cried like a baby, can I tell you tonight, amen, Pentecost is the supernatural. Come on, somebody. It's easy to get caught up in the wrong thing because today if we can't remove the crowd with the real supernatural, we'll just amp up the drum beat a little bit. Crank the PA up louder. Maybe that'll move somebody. And I'm just saying God's dealt with me on a personal level and I'm saying God help me that my dependence is not on the fleshly manifestations of things as much as it is on the spirit of God moving through me showing himself mighty to the rest of the world around me. Amen. Wouldn't it be good to get such a move of Pentecost in our church and in in every one of us? We don't have to blow it trying to tell anybody we're Pentecostal. There you stand in Walmart. Somebody say, my son's got spinal bifida and you lay hands in the middle of Walmart and he straightens out and God heals it. Let me tell you that right there. So anybody, this God we're talking about is real. I still serve the God who came down and licked up the barrels of water that were in the trench whenever Elijah prayed a 63 word prayer and the fire of God fell. It's time we get back to believing in the supernatural in the house of God. I don't know why the Lord just put this in my spirit. I'm going to say this and move on. We're also going to have to give God place to do the supernatural. I don't ever want to get so caught up and running through the motions that I don't let the Lord have his way. I've been in services before and so have you where it paid to wait on the Lord. You ever have them times where you felt the Holy Ghost moving? You're waiting. Somebody's supposed to be obeying the Lord right now. I feel it. Somebody's about to give out a message or something about to happen. You ever been there? I've been in services like that before as a pastor. And I said, let's just wait on the Lord. And we prayed. The saints of God prayed. And we waited. And then all of a sudden, the power of God spoke, moved, and showed himself mighty. I'll tell you, if we'll give place to the Lord and let him know that we're trusting in him for the supernatural, I believe God will give us the supernatural. Say amen, somebody. Pentecost was motivation. I have never seen, I'll tell you what Pentecost wasn't. Pentecost wasn't dead. And I've never seen an hour whenever preachers, pastors, and people are doing everything they can just to motivate people to do as much as go to the house of God. Honey, if you can't hardly get people to go to church, how are you going to get them to go door to door and knock on the door and invite somebody to the house of God? Hey, man, pull up a hot dog cart in the middle of a park somewhere and feed the homeless and tell them about Jesus. How are you going to get anybody to do that if you can't even get them to come to church? I tell you what, we have a crisis. uh, There's a lack of motivation, but Pentecost was all all about motivation because I can tell you what took place and I'll get into this probably next week or the week after. Amen. When Pentecost took place, persecution drove them out. Persecution caused them to be driven out and when they were driven out, God used it as part of his plan Amen. to propagate the gospel everywhere. The Bible shows us they were turning the world upside down not meeting once or twice a week in a local church just talking about how good God is showing off our talents come on somebody they were a motivated people and I pray God let there be a Pentecostal sweeping of motivation here we can have all the windshields Amen, leave the conference, paying an $800 bill for the hotel. Amen, talk about how good to worship. Oh, so-and-so, they my favorite singer and all that. That may have its place, but what we really need, Sister Farmer, is to get souls saved and in the church and in the house of God. Amen, a demonstration of the power of God in such a way that people leave and say, I don't know what just happened, but that had to be a God thing tonight. That's what we need more than anything. The church of day of Pentecost, it was purpose. What was Pentecost? It was purpose. You see, Jesus had gone to the cross and he said it out of his own mouth, it is finished. He had done a finished work and now I've given my church purpose. 
The Pentecostal church is a church with purpose. And the last thing that the Holy Ghost gave me, the Pentecostal church is commission. He has told us to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Well, I'm Pentecostal and all God wants me to do is hold down a pew. And this may not be very popular. It's all God wants me to do right here. I'm going to share a little story with you. I've shared this a few times over the years and then I'm going to try to close. I was a young evangelist, got my first revival, preaching at the McClenny Church of God, I mean, uh, Dr. Zinlet Church of God, very first revival, full week. Brother McHugh was the pastor at the time, and I went to that revival, preached, gave it my everything. I've shared with you many times how that before the revival ever started, as a young man, I didn't understand a lot. But I was hungry for revival, and Brother Eric, I got down, I started praying. And boy, I really sought God for that revival. They had told me, said, oh, Brother Teague was just here in revival. And he, I used to love to hear Brother Teague preach. They said, Sister Linda Bachman was just here preaching revival, and now here comes this brand new evangelist going to preach. I said, well, i got to get down and really do some praying, Brother Ralph. And when I got down and asked the Lord, I said, God, this is my question. I said, God, what is it going to take to have a real revival? And I never, by the grace of God, by his help and grace, forget what he said. He said to me, where there is a hungry people and my anointing, there will be a revival. Years later, I thought about that, and I've seen a lot of places where the anointing of God was, but there were no hungry people. I've seen church services where the people were hungry, but there was no anointing. But whenever you get the anointing and the hunger in the same place, it's like, a, it's like an Amtrak train that collides and I'm going to tell you something, revival comes. I've told you the story about how that whenever I showed up during that revival one night, the service hadn't even begun. They had a prayer room in the back of the church. And uh, one was a men's prayer room, one was a ladies prayer room. And I told my wife, I said, one of these days, and I tell you, God made a way. I said, one of these days, if I ever pastor, I said, I want to have us a prayer room. She said, why? I said, because of what I saw during this revival. I walked in one night, church hadn't started, and I just walked through the foyer. I seen a couple different people that had just came out shook hand, all of a sudden I was hearing a noise and a commotion. Anybody here whenever a bunch of saints of God's really get after and they start praying, oh God, you can feel it just as soon as you walk in the house. I'd like to get back to the place where it's not a dead atmosphere. If you walk in, you feel the power of the Holy Ghost. When I walked in, I could hear the prayer of the saints. All of a sudden, uh, amen, the door slung open on the ladies' prayer room. Uh, it flung open so hard it banged it with the wall. Here come one sister. It looked like somebody walked up to a bee's nest and swatted the side of here come once in a wow running out the house out of that prayer room here come another here come another and another and the next thing you know they're running wild around that church of pack God shouting and rejoicing the Holy Ghost all over there and I thought my God that's where if I could see revival was taking place amen but I can tell you what happened during that revival is what changed a lot of my view and perspective on ministry from that day forward there was a man that went to church there. He may still go to church there. I don't know. But I give him credit for this. His name was Lawton Jeffers. He was a redheaded man, tall redheaded man. One night, I was walking out the church. And there he was in the foyer. He stuck his hand out, Brother Eric. Got a hold of his hand. You ever have somebody shake your hand? They don't want to let go of it. Older people do that. I don't know what it is with older folk. I like to hold your hand and look at you. Sometimes you're just thinking. <laughs> but he got a hold of my hand. He held it and pulled it closer. And he looked at me straight in the face. Tears are running down his face. He said, son, he said, listen to me. He said, listen to an older man. He said, you're still young. And you still have the ability to turn the world upside down. He said, I ran from the call of God. For many, many years, he said, I was successful in business. He was in construction and whatnot. And from what I heard, he has a really big, nice house, sent all of his kids through college, and I mean, just made a big, nice lifestyle and what have you from what I understand. He said, but here I am. He said, I'm getting older, and I can't do what I used to do. And he said, I've wasted nearly a whole lifetime. He said, I kept telling myself one of these days, 
I'm going to do it. One of these days, I'll get around to doing it. And he said, but one of those days never really came. I'll be honest with you. This is just being totally honest. When he first told me this, I kind of somewhat dismissed it, didn't fully absorb it, because I've had many of people come to me and tell me that they were called. And you ever heard the terminology, daddy called, mama called, daddy called, mama sent or whatever? There's a lot of folk that say they're called. They want no more called than a Cracker Jack box. But when I got ready to leave that revival, I love preaching. I've always loved preaching. And I had about a three-hour trip coming back from Jacksonville back to, I think we were living in Claremont back at the time. And Brother Eric, I stopped by their little, their little media place, a little sound booth. And on the ledge... They were doing cassette ministry, and they had all sorts of cassettes up there. And the preacher had already told me, he said, if you want any of them preaching tapes, you know, go in and get you some. So I'm going, and I'm looking at some of the preaching tapes. Oh, that looked, that looked like that would be a good one. And I pick up another one, it looked like it would be a good one. So I set them aside, and I picked up a tape. And it said, Lawton Jeffers. I looked at it a second time, and it says something about my shepherd. So I put that tape aside. I thought, well, I'll listen to that later. I got into the vehicle, went to put one tape in. It didn't want to work right. So I'm driving down the road, Brother Eric, and I reach over and I grab that tape. This happened to be Lawton Jeffers. I popped it in there. I was about five, ten minutes into the sermon, and I'm driving down the road squalling. As sure as I'm standing there, the man flat preached. And it was that moment that it hit me. How many years of wasted life, anointing, talent, gift. God, through Pentecost, gave the church a commission. And if we sit on our hands and do nothing while we say one of these days... One of these days may never come, and you do like Brother Myers now that I'm on a place in my life where I've gotten sick and I'm not as able to do a lot of the things. Thank God I'm able to pastor like this because if I'd evangelize, I'd have a hard time preaching every single day, every single night. But I can tell you this much. I can look back. I was on the way to church tonight. Sister Farmer, I was thinking to myself, thank God for the many years as a young man. I'm still some uh, considering me to be young, but as a younger man, I obeyed the Lord. I did what God called me, but I can contribute a lot of that to what an, an older man told me one night with tears running down his face as that red headed man looked at me and said son do all you can right now while you can do you know that's Pentecost Pentecost ain't a dead church Pentecost ain't a church that just sits around and waits for the next Sunday service Pentecost is a church that's alive Pentecost is a church that is active whether you got to do it on your job hey amen God didn't give you the Holy Ghost just to sing better he didn't give you the Holy Ghost just to preach better he didn't give you the Holy Ghost just to talk better. He gave you the Holy Ghost to win this world. Every time you run into a sinner, you remember that. He didn't give you the Holy Ghost just to talk in a tongue. He didn't give you the Holy Ghost so you could just say, I was baptized. There's a lot of folks sitting on church pews that may have got baptized 30 years ago, but there's no power in their life tonight. Let me ask you a question. Are we really Pentecostal? Stand to your feet all across the house. Boy, I know this might be a different message altogether, but this is what God gave me, and I sure hope to goodness that when it's all over with that we can do some hard examination and say, God, help us to be the church. What, Brother Myers, do you hope happens out of this? Let me tell you. What I hope happens is that we'll get a renewed motivation that says, God, let us do more. You know, we may look around and say, well, God, we don't have what the other church has. We don't have as many piano players, and we ain't got as many bass drums kickers and him and drum players and we ain't got this and we ain't got that can I tell us tonight you don't need very many all you need is a few faithful people that are absolutely positively guaranteed on fire for God and you can turn a whole city upside down and I tell you what it's going to take is a revolution and the only way it's going to start is somebody's got to be the spark amen if you got to start just passing out a track if you got to start going in the highways and hedges 
If you got to start by walking out your front door and evangelizing your neighborhood, it's got to start somewhere. I was thinking to myself today, what a tragic shame that it is of where a lot of the church has come to. Brother Farmer, Sister Farmer, if y'all play something, it'll help me slow this thing down. My heart is still full. Still full. I have a friend of mine through social media, a young woman that I don't know if she claims to be saved. I don't think she does, but she had made a statement today that she was frustrated. She went into a place of business to get something, and on her way out, couldn't get the buggy to work. This was going wrong. That was going wrong. And of all things, when she walked out the door, Brother Eric, there stood somebody who wanted to preach the Word of God and beg for money. I don't know about you, and everyone you may have your own prerogative on this, but I believe it just like this. David said, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor God's seed begging for bread. It's one thing to take up collection in the church among the saints and the body of believers to, to take and keep, take care and pay for the finances of the church, but to go out into the world and beg the sinner to finance God's church. I don't agree with that. And that is where we've come to in the day that we're living in. We got people standing on street corners when they should be preaching the gospel without asking for anything. But instead, we got people with a boot or a bucket in, in highways, stopping traffic, asking, begging them to pay the church's bills. Let me tell you something. I'll go straight to God. If God chooses to use somebody, I'm not saying God can't use a sinner, amen, to take care of the needs of the church. But I will tell you this much. If we'll get our priorities right in the church, we won't be out nowhere. And I know nobody here does that, but does anyone understand what I'm saying? Instead of being in the highways and hedges telling people about the love of God, amen, without price or money, telling them that the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ was paid through the shed blood of Jesus uh, and they need the Lord God. Uh, amen, God forbid that we be out there begging somebody for money. We ought to be out there doing something to show them we love them. That's where a lot of the church is today. You may say, Pastor Myers, I've never been on a mission trip. I sure would like to go to Africa. I sure would like to go to Italy or Cuba, Guatemala. God forbid that if we want to go somewhere else and tell somebody else, but we can't even tell those around us in our local community, there's something wrong with that picture. I know certain people are called to certain ministries, but if we're Pentecostal, let's be Pentecostal. I love to shout. I love to run. I love to rejoice. I might get loud at times, but I'm going to tell you, I want to be that church that the Bible talked about on the days of Pentecost. I want to see the supernatural. I want to see the manifestation of the Spirit and that it be liberty and God be at the helm of the church. Everyone that will tonight, you want to find yourself a place and you pray and say, God, help us tonight. Tonight, God, I want all of you. God, help our churches to resemble that New Testament Pentecostal church. I realize we're living in a different day and a different time, but it still takes upper room prayer. It still takes a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire to see a great manifestation. In